animal-based diet another fad or is it a flexible nutritional framework that can help you and your family to improve your health and well-being hey welcome back and in this video i'm going to share with you everything i know about the animal-based diet that my family and i have been following since 2021 so in this video, I'll share with you the pros and cons of animal-based eating, why an animal-based diet is superior to the paleo diet, despite many of the similarities, why an animal-based diet is easier to maintain than a strict carnivore or ketogenic diet, why counting macros, meaning protein, fat, and carbs, is a waste of time, but why you might want to do it anyway, or at least keep tabs on some of those macros. And I'll also share with you an animal-based diet food list with additional information to make grocery shopping and meal planning a breeze. I should also mention that nothing in this video should be considered a medical advice, so check out the disclaimer in the description. Now, before we get into the nitty-gritty, let me explain how my wife, two kids, and I adopted an animal-based diet to improve our health and well-being. Now, to make a long story short, uh, my wife and I watched a Netflix documentary several years ago about how much added sugars the average American consumes every year. And when we saw it, we, we decided to cut out sugars, added sugars, entirely from our diet. And that led into discovering the paleo diet. Actually, a friend of ours introduced us to the paleo diet. And despite my wife's protests, you know, we adopted it and felt incredible changes. Like my IBS, my irritable bowel syndrome was gone, more energy, fewer headaches, you know, induced by, you know, drinking sodas and all of the things we did in the past. It was a game changer for us to change to paleo. Later on, I discovered a ketogenic diet and my, both my wife and I started adopting that. And we did this for a couple of years before I briefly played around with a carnivore, a carnivore based diet by eating only meat for a couple of months. And then in, in June or July of 2021, I met Dr. Paul Saladino at an animal-based retreat in Costa Rica. And after learning more about, you know, why he reintroduced certain carbohydrates, I decided I want to give this a try. And both my, my entire family really and I have been on an animal-based diet that is obviously focused around animal-based foods, protein, fat, organs, etc. but also some of the least toxic plants and certain carbohydrates from raw honey, from raw dairy, etc. And we've been on a journey ever since and we've never felt better. And I truly believe that animal-based eating is a very appropriate and flexible dietary framework that not, can only not only improve your health and well-being, but it's also you know, socially much more acceptable and easier to maintain than some of the other diets that might also have, you know, similar health benefits. So maybe let's talk about, you know, first, what is the animal-based diet? What does it mean? Well, the name already implies it's centered around animal-based foods, right? That particular muscle meat, bones, if you will, fat and organs, but it can also include eggs, you know, preferably, you know, pastured, raw dairy, preferably fermented depending on how you handle dairy raw honey you know ideally from your region so you get some of those you know nutrients and uh, potential allergens like pollen from your local environment to kind of prep your immune system so you don't suffer from real allergies then in spring but you can also include uh, include some of the least toxic plants such as cucumbers and squashes and we're going to talk about more uh, all the things that you can and also some of the things you cannot eat on an animal-based diet. But the bottom line really is that you want to focus on foods that are high in bioavailable and readily absorbable micronutrients, such as enzymes, vitamins, and minerals. And to avoid certain inflammatory foods like seed oils and most plant foods that are high in defense chemicals, such as antinutrients, or phytoestrogens that can negatively impact your gut and immune health, cause inflammation, and increase your risk for developing a metabolic disease. So that's in a nutshell what the animal-based diet is. But within the animal-based framework, there is a lot of flexibility in terms of how much protein, fat, and carbohydrates you can consume and how you can mix and match those ingredients. And so the pros of an, or the advantage of an animal-based framework is that it's very rich in bioavailable and readily absorbable nutrients. You know, again, that goes back to animal foods being just high in those micronutrients that humans can absorb very easily and very well. Those nutrients are very bioavailable to humans, which is because, you know, humans have been consuming those foods for millions of years or for ever how long you think humans and our ancestors, you know, roamed this planet. It offers a lot of flexibility, especially compared to stricter dietary frameworks, like you know maybe a carnivore um, in the extreme case where you can only eat meat, or even a ketogenic diet where you remove 
pretty much all, if not most, carbohydrates or sources of carbohydrates. It doesn't prescribe you how much protein, fat, and carbs you should consume. So there is flexibility in there. Um, unlike a ketogenic diet, which by definition is very low in carbohydrates, relatively high in fat and moderate to high in protein. And in a, you know, from a health perspective, it really enables your body and metabolism to function op optimally. And that's really the, it, it, it makes you feel your best likely. If you, if you find it within the animal-based framework, if you can figure out, okay, how many carbs, how, many, how much protein, how much fat you need, you know, based on how your body responds, you can really fine tune it to function and feel optimally. And that's really one of the, or the reason why my entire, fam my entire family and I are on an animal-based diet. There are some downsides to it. It's still more restrictive than the standard American diet where you, you know, everything goes, you know, it's not that you on an animal based diet, you go to the store and you pick up a, you know, a bag of Oreos, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, you see and, and you feel like, oh, I want to have this or crave for, you know, no, it is certainly more restrictive than that. But in a sense, I would argue it does not restrict you from, from consuming all the foods that are good for you. It just restricts you from consuming the ones that are not good for you anyway, you know. What the animal-based diet, another con that it doesn't take into account is that it doesn't take food preparation methods into account that can mitigate many of the plant toxins. So, you know, humans over thousands of years have developed food processing methods. And I'm not talking about, you know, processed food you find in the grocery store, but I'm referring to fermenting, sprouting, soaking, heating, grinding, you know, all of the things that we can mechanically do to food to reduce the toxic load of that food, in particular plant food. You know, for example, you can ferment potatoes to reduce their glycemic index and to get some of those anti-nutrients out of the potato. You can peel a potato because most of the defense chemicals of the potato plant are in the skin, which if you think about it, makes only sense because the skin is what protects the potato, you know, from the soil around it, from the insects, from, you know, organisms around it could potentially harm the potato. And the same goes with many other things. You can sprout grains, you can ferment grains, you can ferment dairy. You can do a lot of things to make the nutrients in those foods more bioavailable, while at the same time reducing their toxic load. Now, many of those things might not completely remove the toxins in those plants, but you might get them to a level where if you're metabolically healthy, you can consume them. And so the animal-based diet doesn't really take that into account. It just says, you know, grains and all of those things, you know, don't have, period. I think that if you know how to prepare certain foods, there is certainly room, again, if you're metabolically healthy for some of those foods, like in our case, we occasionally consume fermented, double fermented, you know, sourdough bread. Is it ideal or is it necessary for, our op for maintaining optimal health? Absolutely not. It might even have a negative impact to a degree, but I feel like based on our metabolic health, based on our lifestyle, we can easily get away doing this without you know, dramatically impacting our health. And so those things, the animal-based diet doesn't take into account. And I, I would encourage you to do take those into account because it makes then the animal-based framework even easier and more flexible, you know. Now let's talk about some of the foods that you can consume and some of the foods you cannot consume or at least not without proper preparation. You know, obviously red meat or any meat from, from responsibly raised ruminants that includes, you know, cattle, buffalo, you know, venison, if, if you will, uh, camel, anything, you know, that, that consumes grass I and mean, converts it into protein, meaning meat, is a great choice. And I always recommend going with the responsibly raised, you know, the meat of responsibly raised animals, you know, grass fed, grass finished, pasture raised, etc. But the truth is, if you're on a budget and all you can afford is conventionally raised red meat that you find at Costco or at Walmart or what have you, you know, go for it. Don't stress out about it. Any meat, I would just stay away from anything that has antibiotics in it, but any meat is, is better than no meat or than the alternative, you know. Also, I want to, you know, point out, I have a couple of videos, you know, on, on where you can find meat, pasteurized meat, relatively cheap, and that includes Aldi and, and Walmart. So check those out. I'm going to link them down below. There are other meats that you can obviously eat if red meat isn't your thing now, you know, and that includes meat from monogastric animals like poultry uh, and pork now or pigs. Now, the thing is, all the meat of monogastric animals has, in most cases, a 
a non-favorable fatty acid composition, meaning that those animals, specifically chickens and pigs, have a much higher concentration of polyunsaturated fatty acids, in particular linoleic acid, than the meat of ruminants. And that is because the feed those animals are fed. You know, any commercially raised poultry or, or pig gets feed that's high in PUFAs. And so because of the way their digestion works and the digestive system works, they cannot rearrange the fatty acids and amino acids in that feed to make it work for them to turn them into saturated fat, let's say. You know, if they get a feed that's high in PUFAs, their meat is going to, or their own body fat is going to be high in PUFAs too. And I have a separate podcast episode uh, with Dr. Anthony Gustin where we discuss the downsides of meat from monogastric animals. But if you can find meat from well-raised, well-fed monogastric animals, you know, by all means, you know, have that as well. I would just not eat those meats at the exclusion of red meat or meat from ruminants. Organ meat obviously is another thing that you can and should have on an animal-based diet. Organs are arguably the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, in particular the liver, but also heart, spleen, kidney, etc., and all of the organs in between. And I recommend for you to include fresh organs as part of your diet if you can. If you absolutely don't like the taste of texture, you know, the good news is there are high quality freeze-dried beef organ supplements, such as the ones my wife and I sell at Kai Supplements. So check that out. I'm going to link it down below as well. That's an option, very convenient, doesn't taste like anything. You just pop four capsules a day and you get your, you know, the equivalent of one ounce of fresh organ meat every day. There is really no excuse not to do this other than maybe budgetary concerns. Fat. Obviously, you can have, you know, in particular, saturated fats from, from animals, you know, including butter, ghee, tallow, uh, etc. I would, you know, be cautious with lard and duck fat, again, unless it comes from animals that were well-raised and well-fat, simply because of the polyunsaturated fatty acid issue. So be careful with that. But again, I would rather have, you know, a pastured lard than, you know, canola oil or any, you know, vegetable oils or seed oils for that matter. Seafood is another thing you can obviously have on an animal-based diet. There are some people who argue that, you know, seafood, fish, etc. are not quite as nutritious as the meat of ruminants. You know, I would argue that depending on what your preferences are, depending on where you live, you know, if you're in the Mediterranean somewhere, you know, by all means, you know, likely or the chances are your ancestors consumed more seafood than if they were landlocked somewhere. So I would not go too crazy about, you know, whether or not you should avoid seafood or how much you should have. If that's what you love eating, if that's what's available to you, if you have, you know, well responsibly caught, I guess, seafood and not necessarily farmed, you know, salmon and stuff, you know, go at it. Eggs are another great source of micronutrients in particular, but also protein, of course. And, you know, one of the reasons why we raise our own chickens on the Coomer homestead. So we have uh, the best eggs we can possibly get our hands on. You know, we feed our hens low poofer feed and do everything we can to produce the best quality eggs. Um, I recommend pastured, of course, you know, and well-raised. Uh, but really, any eggs, you know, are probably better than no eggs. So make that a staple in your diet as well. Sweet fruits, you know, that's really where, you know, the, the animal-based diet differs a little bit or a lot from maybe a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet because, you know, you can have sweet fruits as much as you want to. And the reason why you should have or can have sweet fruits but not many of the other veggies is because you know the fruits of let's say an apple tree the plant wants you to eat the sweet fruit so you spread the seeds you know it's intended by nature for the fruits the sweet fruits when they are ripe and in season to be eaten and so that's the argument and that's the reason why those sweet seasonal fruits that are you know ripe have generally speaking lower levels of anti-nutrients and of plant-based defense chemicals than let's say a spinach or leafy greens or you know uh, tubers or any of the other types of plants you could potentially eat and so sweet fruits go you know have at it make sure it's seasonal ideally you know and organic if if possible if not you know if you cannot afford or don't want to afford organic just buy the ones that have the least that are less likely to be contaminated with a lot of pesticides you know so stay away from the dirty dozens and you know pick the others uh, there are also some non-sweet fruits that you can have on an animal based diet, including avocados and olives uh, because they also have relatively low levels of those toxins and defense chemicals and then there are some traditional veggies i guess that would fall within the the least toxic plant category and, and those include cucumbers zucchini and other types of squashes especially if you peel 
and de-seed them. So there are still chemicals in the skin and in the seeds, but if you remove them and if you have the right tools, like, you know, a peeler, obviously, and there are special like de-seeders that my, you know, wife uses to like de-seed a cucumber, like in two seconds, very convenient, very quick. And then you can enjoy the rest of, of the fruit or of the, the veggie without any concerns. Now, other foods that you can consume on an animal-based diet are bone broth, obviously, and bone marrow. You know, those are obviously also animal-based foods that are high in nutrients and have none of the chemicals. Now, the list of things you cannot consume is fairly long, so I'm not going to go into all of that. But I should say that I have a, a food list that you can download for free. I'm going to link it down below. Um, and that includes not only all the foods you can have and why that is, but also all the things you should not consume and a list of foods that you can potentially consume if you prepare the food right. And I'm talking again about, you know, soaking, fermenting, sprouting, peeling, etc., etc. So there is a lot of, I think, gray area that you can leverage if you're metabolically healthy to massage the animal-based framework into something that works for you. Like I've mentioned in our case, we do occasionally consume white rice. We soak it overnight. We, you know, discard the water, which has, you know, a lot of those toxins that were, that leached out of the rice grains. And then, you know, it's white rice. So there is no anti-nutrients in the rice is already reduced by removing, you know, the bran and the outer layers that are typically higher in those uh, defense chemicals. So we use white rice, we soak it, and then we cook it. We seem to be doing well with that and on occasion we don't have that every day or even every week for that matter we also occasionally bake sourdough bread or make our own sourdough pizza again by firm dub, double fermenting you know the wheat again nothing that you need to do nothing that uh, is great for your health but something that could potentially work for you you have to you know play with it try it out see how you feel to make the animal-based framework a little bit more, I guess, socially acceptable and, and more really more relaxed and easier to maintain. Because at the end of the day, you know, you need to find a framework that works for you that you can maintain for the rest of your life. Animal-based eating is not a 30-day in like detox or what have you. It's a lifestyle, you know, and you want to make that lifestyle work for you so you can maintain it in the long run. Now, a couple of quick notes uh, before we wrap it up on how the animal-based diet is different from a carnivore diet. Well, you know, the carnivore diet consists of only meat. There is no plant-based material in there. Now, there are different levels of carnivore diet, you know, that you can pick and choose from. In the strictest sense, you eat meat, you know, ideally red meat and nothing else. Then there are some, you know, I guess, easier to maintain levels where you can also include eggs or maybe dairy, you know, like cheese or, you know, kefir or, you know, raw milk for you know or whatever so there are different levels that you can also make the carnivore diet a little bit easier to maintain but the big thing is you know sweet fruits and especially you know a lot of those carbohydrates that you can consume on an animal based diet are off limits on a carnivore diet but even within the carnivore the strict carnivore framework there are those who eat only muscle meat like you know dr sean baker, baker i think is one of those that doesn't consume any organs i would argue that even on a well-implemented carnivore diet you should eat the animal nose to tail you know there it's it's inconsistent with nature to only eat the steak and leave everything else behind to me, that doesn't make sense, but it seems to be working for some, including Dr. Baker, but I think he also eats eggs. So that's maybe where he compensates for the lack of organs in his diet. But again, you know, carnivore diet, more strictly focused on the meat and not so much on anything else, even though there are certain levels where you can scale it down a little bit. Now, animal-based diet versus paleo diet is more interesting because there are certainly a lot of similarities. And, you know, the paleo diet aims to mimic the eating habits of a prehistoric ancestors and taking the perspective that the ideal human diet is the one that fueled millions of years of human evolution. So it makes a lot of sense. But the thing is, some of the foods that are allowed on a paleo diet, like, you know, most plants really, I mean, almost every, all the veggies you can eat, obviously no grains and legumes, those are not paleo friendly, but everything else from leafy greens, from brassicas, from many of the foods, uh, nuts and seeds, you know, many of the foods that we know have significant amounts of defense chemicals and toxins, such as antinutrients, are allowed on a paleo diet. Whereas on an animal-based diet, there are not. On the flip side, you can have raw dairy on an animal-based diet and or dairy in general, I, would, I should say, ideally raw dairy, but dairy in general. On a paleo diet, dairy is a no-go because, you know, humans didn't con or never consumed dairy until about, you know, 10 to 15,000 years ago when we started domesticating animals. Before that, there were, you know, very likely that we had no access to, to dairy. We didn't milk wild animals, you know. 
the assumption is. And so there, you know, I kind of, you know, disagree because I think raw dairy can be a great food for many people. You know, some others might completely disagree and say dairy is, you know, humans have no, no reason to consume any dairy. It seems to be working well for us. Again, it, you know, try it out, see how it works and, and, and go, you know, based on that. But nuts and seeds and, you know, spinach and, bro and broccoli and, you know, like leafy greens and, and brassicas and, and those kind of things, I think are terrible for our health. Now, again, nuance, you know, is important here because you might argue that, well, you know, our ancestors, if they find, you know, a bushel of nuts, you know, once every so often they consume it, that, pro that probably didn't have a significant negative health impact. And I tend to agree. But the problem with the modern paleo diet is that many people say, well, if it's paleo friendly, if it's allowed on paleo, I can have as much as I want to. And this is a thing where we run into an issue because consuming nuts or nut flours every single day, nut butters and, you know, sweets baked, you know, with nut flours, and we have that a lot, that's not consistent with, you know, human history. And it's certainly not good for our health. It's detrimental to our health. But having it once every so often is probably benign, especially if you know how to process, you know, some of those foods by maybe soaking, sprouting, fermenting, what have you. So, you know, that has to be taken into consideration. But overall, I think there is a lot in common between animal-based and paleo. But overall, I think the room for error is maybe slightly in favor of animal-based eating because you can eat a lot of the wrong foods that are paleo-friendly on a paleo diet and think you're good even though you're not. Now there is one exception to that maybe and that I think applies to both paleo and animal alike and that is the amount of carbohydrates you can have because if you watch you know some of Dr. Saladino's content and you see that he consumes 250-300 grams of carbs a day and you think well you know I can do that too. Chances are you cannot. I probably cannot you know based on what I know you know, Dr. Saladino goes surfing several hours every single morning. So yes, if he has an orange juice and maybe raw milk with added honey or whatever, and sweet fruits and whatever he has, you know, in the morning and then burns off all of that energy surfing for multiple hours, then yes, you know, he can get away with this. If I do that, even though I burn a boatload of calorie as well every day, I don't think I could get away with it. If I consumed 300 grams of carbs, I would, I would increase my body fat. You know, and I think that applies to most people. So be mindful that just because a certain type of food is allowed on a diet like fruits, sweet fruits on an animal based diet doesn't mean you should be consuming mostly fruits. You know, you need to make every meal centered around, you know, animal protein and then use fat and carbs strategically based on your energetic needs, based on, you know, what type of fuel you need, what type of exercise you do, how active you are and many other factors, and also probably based on how you feel. But just going blindly in and eating a ton of fruits, either on paleo or on animal-based, is probably not going to be a good idea. Now, that leads us into the difference between animal-based and ketogenic diet. Well, you know, as I've mentioned already, on animal-based diet, you can have carbohydrates. There is no you know, prescribed limit to carbohydrates. On a ketogenic diet, you know, it's a low carb diet, which has some pros, especially if you want to become more metabolically flexible. I would argue that cutting out carbs, you know, is a good thing. But in the long run, I believe that the animal based diet is more conducive to optimal health, especially for the average Joe that does not have a specific health concern to address. Like if you have insulin issues, if you have high blood sugar issues, etc. A ketogenic diet, a well implemented ketogenic diet that takes food quality into account is certainly a good thing. And that's one of the reasons why I, you know, tried that for or did it for three years to kind of figure out how it works in, in my case. And it has worked incredibly well. But there is a limit, I think, to how long humans should be on a low carb diet. I don't think carbs are bad. And so, you know, take this into account and listen to your body. Now, that really leads us to why, you know, why you might want to consider paying attention to your macronutrient intake, even though I think counting macros, like keeping tabs of how much protein, fat, and carbs you eat every day is a waste of time. Um, and I've talked about this in, in a reel, but I should mention that you want to take, you want to pay attention to your carb intake on an animal-based diet so you don't overdo it. You know, only consume as many carbs as you need to fuel your exercise regimen, your body in general, but don't, you know, more carbs are not better. Excess carbs are stored as fat on the body, you know, so chances are you're not going to need 250 grams of carbs a day. I am fairly active. I'm, well, I burn 3000 calories a day on average. 
and I consume maybe 100 grams of carbs a day. I don't need 250, I don't need 300. If I did again, I would probably look differently. Or I'd have to you know, move more, burn more calories, and I don't want that. You know, you can get away with overeating protein, you can get away with overeating fat, because both of those two macros are not only used for energy, but for many other metabolic processes, but overeating carbs is a sure way of gaining weight. And so you need to be attention, pay attention to that. Now, if you wonder, well, you know, that's all great and fine, but how can I do animal based on a budget? You know, meat is expensive. Well, as I said before, you don't need to eat steaks. You don't need to eat grass fat if that's not in your budget. They are reasonably priced meats at Aldi and Walmart and Costco, some of which are actually 100% grass fed, you know, so you can find them there as well in those discount stores, but get the cheaper cuts of meat, get stew meat, you know, invest in a slow cooker, you know, it's a one-time investment and you can make any meat tender and taste delicious. And if you just, you know, cook it with some beef stock or even chicken stock or what have you, you know, any meat tastes good coming out of the slow cooker. Ground meat is, is usually fairly inexpensive. Organs are relatively inexpensive, generally speaking, you know, to get your micronutrients in. Eggs are, eggs have gone up in price, I know. But even if it's, if they're conventionally raised, you know, those eggs are likely better than having no eggs at all. Organic fruits are great if you can afford it. If not, you know, conventionally grown as well, just make sure they are not on the dirty dozen list. So for example, avocados, pineapple, kiwi, and melon are usually not sprayed much, even when conventionally grown. And they're much less expensive, especially at some of those, you know, big discount stores like Costco, for example. And so that should definitely help. If you want to learn more about the animal based diet, make sure you check out my blog post, which goes into more details in terms of if you can use it and how you can use it for weight loss and whether or not, you know, organ meats are critical and all of the other things that I haven't had time to discuss in this video. So check this out. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and I hope I'll see you in the next video.